what's up you guys, Bloody Jacob here with another QMR video set of action movie reviews, quick movie reviews, and this time we're talking about uh, quite the set. Uh, we have not only Chuck Norris in both the Hitman as well as Hero and the Terror, but we also have <laughs> Steven Seagal in Driven to Kill, released in 2009 along with Excessive Force 2, Force on Force, starring Stacey Randall, which came out in 1995. And finally, Red Scorpion 2, starring Matt Malcolm, or Macomb, excuse me, which came out in uh, 1994. Jacob here, meeting my icon, Catherine Isabel. Muddy Jacob, for sexy, awesome, exclusive content. That sounds like a warning. It's an invitation. Yeah. And yes, my brother is going to kill me for mispronouncing his name, but so I'll try at it again in a few minutes here. Uh, but yeah, so once again, if you guys haven't watched a QMR video from me before, it is not my original concept. <laughs> I'm aware of that. You know, I got it from Chris Stuckman. Um, it's basically just a way of uh, me not putting pressure on myself to review every single thing one at a time that I watch, so I can just relax and watch things at my leisure without worrying about doing a video. And as well as a full-time job, it's just easier to uh, sort of try and get things reviewed together in one cluster. Um, as long as they fit together in some way, you know, with these being action movies, it at least makes a little bit of sense, even though some of these are different from each other. Um, but yeah. So, we'll start off, I think, with, uh, why don't we just go right for it. Driven to Kill, starring Steven Seagal. And again, that came out in 2009, I do believe. Yes, it did. And, uh, yeah, I've done a lot of Steven Seagal movie reviews on this channel at this point. Um, to varying degrees of success, of explaining my love-hate relationship with, uh, you know, Sensei Seagal. <laughs> um, and this one, uh, was actually one of, the, one of the successes, oddly enough. I actually liked Driven to Kill. And, don't get me wrong, there are issues with it, but I think it is one of his best 2000s films. Uh, it's probably going to end up being one of his best 2000s and 2010s films. Um, and, really, I think uh, this line of movies like uh, Into the Sun and maybe one or two others, I do like more than some of his, you know, apparent prime era films. For one reason or another. <laughs> Um, and again, I recognize the issues with it. He does have a pretty bizarre Russian accent in this. Um, sometimes it's, it's his voice, and other times you question if it's a dub or not. I don't know, but I don't think it was as bad on that end as uh, some of the other 2000s films with the dubbing. Um, so the, the accent takes some getting used to, but it is what it is. It's not the worst, I guess. Um, it's basically about an ex-Russian mobster who is now a prime novelist who must confront his past when his family is targeted by violence. Yep, his daughter's gonna get married, then it turns out, you know, connections from his past come back to on him, as well as who his daughter's getting married to, ironically, you know, connecting to what he was involved in years ago. So yeah, that kind of thing. And then he goes after the guys who attacked his, uh, his family. Uh, but yeah. So this one, uh, I, I liked, I don't know, something about it. 
Steering Seagull shows a sliver of emotion, you know, when the attack happens, you know, when his daughter is, uh, you know, uh, severely injured, and that's going to spoil it and say if she dies or not for you, I won't spoil it, um, but you see him exhaling, um, you even see him actually trying to uh, show some anguish and sadness in his face for a second too, it's kind of weird. <laughs> um, still, you know, the usual performance you'd expect from Seagal, don't get me wrong. Um, I also do gotta mention that uh, Laura Manil plays his daughter Lainey in this movie. Um, she is a talented actor. She doesn't really have much in the way of screen time, let alone speaking parts in this movie. But I thought at the beginning she was actually quite good, and uh, you know, I know her from a show uh, you know I really love these days called Van Helsing. She is in the first season or so of that. Um, you know, she did a show uh, that was well received on Sci-Fi Side Set called Alphas. Um, and she's been in quite a few things. She's even made an appearance in Supernatural and such. And this movie also features uh, Alex Ponovic, uh, a great guy, another uh, you know main Van Helsing cast member actually, who's done a lot of great genre work, a lot of great action work. Who is now just uh, really becoming something special on his own. Um, you know, he's been in things like The Hundred. He's had you know, roles in Supernatural a couple times. You know, he's in the current uh, Snowpiercer series. I could go on and on. He was even one of the apes in War for the Planet of the Apes. Alex Mondek is an awesome guy. And he's uh, one of the uh, main, you know, antagonists in this, I guess. You know, he plays Tony. He's the, the main guy who actually carries out the attack on Seagal's family. So you can imagine the wrath that he will face from the sensei. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you also have uh, Mike DePod in this, who's been in a large number of TV shows and films as well. You've probably seen him in something. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's not too bad of a film, honestly. And uh, you have to go questioning uh, his daughter's fiance throughout, you know, with the, who his father is and such. Um, you see, maybe this guy actually really did, did and does care about his daughter. Maybe. Um, but yeah, the action in this actually isn't too bad. It's actually constant. It's not like one of those 2000 movies of his that uh, drags. Um, and it's actually fairly violent. You have uh, you know, a few brutal knife kills, a knife fight that actually isn't too bad. The editing can, is a bit choppy, sure. Um, but there's also a fairly entertaining firefight towards the end of the movie, too. Um, I do have this film on Blu-ray, I actually like the cover there. There's an alternative Blu-ray cover, but it's a bit more generic. Um, not that that one isn't, but I think this one looks cooler anyway. <laughs> um, so Driven, Driven to Kill, uh, not too bad. Uh, one of the better times I've had a uh, Seagal movie in a while, and it's probably one of my favorites of his now, for one reason or another. Um, and Seagal actually sort of runs in this movie as well, it's really, really scary. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so if I'd rate this movie, I don't know, man, I could, I, I was entertained by it. Um, the, the villains, I guess, you know, besides Alex Ponovic and such, he, you know, he could have been written better as well, it wasn't his fault. Um, but the villains, they could have been, been more, and, uh, Seagal does get hit a few times in passing towards the end, but again, it would have been great if there felt like there was more of a, more, ten more tension, and maybe, uh, Seagal would actually be killed, but no, there's nothing really to worry about here as usual. Um, but yeah, besides that, kind of above average, I think, above par for what you'd expect from a, you know, kind of current day Seagal movie. Um, and really, I think I actually like it better than some of his, uh, you know, golden era films. So yeah, Driven to Kill actually pretty decent, which is, you know, weird for me to say. And then we're going to be talking about Hero and the Terror, actually, which came out in 1988 and stars Chuck Norris, um, as well as, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name here as well, watch me, um, you know, Jack O'Halloran, maybe not. <laughs> um, Danny was lucky three years ago at the arrest of Terror, a serial killer of young women. Danny's about to be a dad when Terror escapes prison and is back to kill him. Will Danny get lucky this time? So, uh, yeah. Um, this is a movie I was actually anticipating quite a bit. Um, because if you go back and watch, uh, interviews with Chuck Norris when the film was coming out, he was excited, uh, for this role because... 
he wasn't just gonna be like a fighting machine. He was gonna be, you know, capable, mind you, and he was gonna, you know, satisfy what Chuck Norris fans want. Uh, but his character is gonna have some anxiety, some fear, you know, some, uh, you know, trauma through his experience that, you know, with his past encounter with uh, Jack O'Halloran's character, Simon Moon. Um, so he was excited to maybe flex his acting chops a little bit more, and I think Chuck Norris really did su succeed here. I think it's one of his better, if not one of his best, very best acting performances. I mean, I know people don't talk about Chuck Norris for his acting very much, but I've said it before in all my Chuck Norris videos that I do think he's more of a natural than many others in the, in the action drama. I mean, he has this natural like ability to him, this kind of natural you know, uh, conviction, this natural sort of uh, honor about him. That just comes off really well and he, it feels, <coughs> again I said natural but organic as well. Same thing, right? <laughs> um, Jack O'Halloran, of course, he's in one of the Superman movies and he works really well. But they know not to show too, too much of, you know, the killer in the film. Although I do think they could have given him a different haircut or something. Um, he looks, you know, he looks malnourished, his, you know, teeth are yellowing and stuff like that, and, you know, they definitely have, like, a somewhat of a TV sort of, uh, serial killer show vibe to it, I guess. Um, and, you know, the budget does feel a little bit low, that's kind of why I said, why I said TV, um, but it doesn't necessarily hurt the, hurt the film. Um, we also have Brian uh, Thayer as Kay, Chuck's love interest in the movie, he's about to have his baby. I thought she was quite good as well, she surprised me. Um, she may have actually showed the most emotion, you know, like outright emotion in the film, you know. Um, so I thought she did a good job. You have Steve James, who I think is a, you know, kind of a crowd or audience favorite in these types of films. And again, he's underutilized here, but it's still good to see him. Um, but yeah, I think it's shot fairly well. I think it, uh, you know, it might be a bit slow, a bit uneventful for some, because pretty much all the movie is uh, building up to uh, Chuck Norris's character's, you know, confrontation with Simon Moon again. Um, so there's not a whole lot else that happens between them and there, besides the investigation and such. Um, although you do get a pretty entertaining, uh, you know, apprehension of some thugs on a, on a dock. And, uh, you know, Chuck, uh, slugging one of them and ends up taking a woman's purse when he and, uh, his girlfriend are out shopping. So you still get your, your classic Chuck Norris fare there. I hope people recognize as well. Uh, so yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed Hero and the Terror. Um, it is, you know, I've seen some people say it's a lesser version of Silent Rage, and I do think Silent Rage is a superior film. It had an ear extra eeriness throughout that this one unfortunately didn't have. And I, I do think the uh, the fights were a bit more extensive than that. Um, but still, the final one is good here. You know, it lives up to the hype for the most part, although I feel like it could have gone on a little bit longer. Um, you can tell that they really got into it on their own, and they, they did do all their own course choreography and fight work there. Um, so I still thought it was quite good. It, it, you know, I, I, don't, I know it probably won't pop up on a lot of people's all-time favorite Norse films, but it's probably within the top ten for me, honestly. It could very well be still. Uh, so yeah, if I had to rate it, I'm giving it right dead in the middle, an 85%, a solid B. Then we gotta slab on that one. Um, and then, next up, we're gonna be talking about The Hitman, which came out in 1991. And again, it stars Chuck Norris, uh, about a cop who goes undercover as a hitman to bring down a criminal organization. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, you basically have uh, uh, Chuck Norris's character here, uh, Garrett or Grogan, as he goes by later on, um, who is thought to be dead through a betrayal of a supposed partner. Um, then he's basically put into this undercover role, you know, to sort of infiltrate, uh, you know, a prominent criminal group. You know, from within, and then eventually, of course, it leads to confronting his uh, partner again, who had ties of his own. Um, so, you know, it's a little more complex than that. I'm <laughs> doing some up, let down there. Um, yes, he get Chuck Norris with the mullet in this movie. Chuck Norris did, and Van Damme both did it. Um, and as much as I love Van Damme, I think Chuck actually wore it better. Yeah, I'm gonna say it. <laughs> um, and this movie, it, you know, will be is another interesting one for Chuck Norris fans. 
um, because it's not a straight up uh, what you'd expect him to do. I mean, there's not a whole lot of martial arts in this movie, even less than there was in uh, Hero and the Terror. Um, it's more of a you know shooting action type movie. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, Chuck Norris does not physically take down guys in this if he has to, but it's not the main focus. There's definitely a lot more shootouts than there is, you know, hand to hand. Um, and when there is, it's uh, fairly brief in this one. And that's okay, because I think the movie uh, made up for it. And, you know, if I love these guys enough, you know, I gotta be willing to see them do more than just, you know, kicks. That can't be what the movie's all about either. Um, I really like the vibe to this movie. I think it had a really nice sort of. Uh, pulpy, you know, old school, you know, kind of uh, gloomy noir, almost noir type feel to uh, the proceedings that I really enjoyed. Um, it had a decent production value as well. Um, uh, there's also this next door neighbor that uh, Chuck Norris ends up bonding with, uh, you know, the kid. Um, you know, even though he's uh, you know, playing this Rogan person, um, it's still good to see, you know, the, the good side to him. Maybe he hasn't completely lost himself, despite what happened with his partner. Um, by the way, this film also stars uh, Michael Parks as that former partner, um, who plays uh, the bastard, you know, pretty well, I think. Um, yeah, there are there are a good number of shootouts in this. And, uh, you know, there's one part where it almost kind of lost me, where, you know, of course... You know, the, the kid and uh, his mother end up maybe getting caught in the crossfire, or at least put in danger somehow. And, he, I don't know, it just kind of stretched the amount of believability for me that they may have survived what they did, um, or at least the kid. But, you know, it is what it is with that. I almost wish they would have, uh, you know, had something terrible happen to them and have that drive what Chuck Norris does at the end. But, still. You know, it works out, you know, Chuck Norris gets to be a little bit happier for a change in the movie. And we still get a, a pretty damn satisfying classic uh, bad guy Chuck Norris movie death. Um, so that's pretty cool. I really like that, and it's, it's warmed up quite well to me. At first I was a bit lukewarm on it, but I think objectively and uh, even from my own perspective, I, I, it is one of Chuck Norris's best films. So, uh, yeah. And then, next up... Just two more left, guys. Bear with me. Uh, we have... Yeah, we'll go with Excessive Force 2. Force on Force. And no, I did not see the original film. Um, it's one of those that's really only related, uh, you know, in title only. Which you're going to see a trend with with these two films here to close off the video. Um, once you cross this special agent, you've crossed the line. Uh, but yeah, uh, you know, I like my... You know, my female stars, my, uh, you know, great actresses, or just to see a female handle himself believably, I, I always love to get into that. And sometimes when that happens, I can get more behind them than some of the bigger, uh, you know, male names within, uh, TV or film. Um, and this is about Stacey Randall, who plays, uh, Harley Cordell. I love that name. Um, a special forces agent turned investigator who arrives on the scene of an apparent mob hit to help the local police. In actuality, she's hunting down Francis Liddell, her former CEO and lover who shot her in the head when she turned down his offer to become part of the freelance assassination squad he was forming. Ignoring the need for surgery to remove the bullet fragment which still causes her to have occasional bouts of disorientation, she continues her quest to bring down Liddell before he has a chance to kill a mafia informant being held at the police station. Um, so yeah, this is a bit of a gem of a movie, honestly. Um, you know, everyone talks about Cynthia Rothrock as the uh, female action star and, you know, some others, but forget all those, honestly, give me Stacey Randall. Not only does she have the looks, uh, even from that phys physical standpoint, she's more appealing to me than, uh, Rothrock, um, but she pulls off the martial arts in this movie so, so well. Um, I mean, I'm sure there is some stuntable work, perhaps, I, I don't know for sure, there's not a lot of uh, behind-the-scenes info in this movie. Um, if there was, it's very hard to tell. It looks like she did most of her own work, and she pulled it off really nicely. Um, you know, she has, like, an athletic, you know, sort of build, so it can still work from just a perspective standpoint, too. She has some really, really smooth kicks, and she carries herself very well, I thought. Um, and her acting's pretty good too. The they give her character Harley Cordell just enough depth 
um, you know, with a bullet fragment in her head, it causes her to, you know, you get on her side, you get to root for her pretty well in this. Um, and then you have, uh, let's see, uh, but yeah, her former CEO, yeah, Francis Liddell, um, he's a bit of a, you know, a scum, kind of a douchebag, you know, type personality. Um, yeah, yeah, Dan Gauthier, uh, you just really want to see him get his ass kicked, and, you know, he does, um, but he's capable as well, and, uh, you know, I think it meshes well with, uh, you know, her acting style for this role, too. And, yeah, her boyfriend, sort of love interest, who she knew from her past and everything, the, the doctor of sorts, I thought he was a bit bland, perhaps, besides that, the acting was all fine, all, you know, what, what you expect. Um, she is just really, really good in this, and uh, the police station assault, um, I think it's a classic action scene, and uh, her chase to uh, catch up to uh, Liddell towards the end of the movie, and uh, how it ends up, it's really satisfying, and I honestly think this is an action and martial arts classic movie here. Um, I wish more people would see it. I wish uh, Stacey Randall would have done more martial arts films, because I think she uh, was a real you know, hidden star. Um, I look forward to watching her other movie she did a couple years before this called The Assault, and I look forward to seeing her in uh, four and five of the transfers films once I eventually watch those. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, I, not really too much more I can say about Stacey Randall. She uh, kind of blew me away in this movie. Uh, so yeah, really, really like this one. I'd give it probably anywhere from like 87 to like a 90% even, who knows. <laughs> Um, and, and by the way, uh, the two Chuck Norris films, uh, I already said I'd give Hero and the Terror an 85%, and The Hitman, I'd give, uh, you know, probably about an 87%, I'll bump it up a little bit. And finally, we're gonna be talking about Red Scorpion 2, the, again, in title only, sequel to Red Scorpion. Of course, the original Red Scorpion starring Dolph Lundgren. In my opinion, I think one of Dolph Lundgren's best films, one of my very favorite films of his. So I was, uh, you know, interested, you know, to see this movie, to say the least. My brother steered me in this direction. Um, you know, there's a lot of martial artists I love, a lot of action guys I love, but he's dived even further into the well, and he's pulled out some uh, people that, you know, weren't as, uh, you know, recognized as some others for, you know, varying reasons. Um, and Matt McComb, you know, he he has a very, very extensive uh, stunt filmography, stunt career. Um, he's probably done some work in some of your favorite films. He, he did it in mine. Um, and again, this movie has nothing to do with the original Red Scorpion. They reference uh, vaguely Dolph Lundgren's character, Nikolai, once um, in sort of a tie-back type of way, but it's also sort of retconning what Red Scorpion was actually about, and it's really nothing to do with what it actually was about in the original movie. Um, so it's a little annoying um, that they did that, but it, it is what it is with it. It basically, you don't even gotta, you know, you don't even gotta connect it at all. <laughs> it's to that point. Um, basically, uh, Matt McCollum's character is part of the group that's assembled to go after this, uh, you know, group of neo-Nazis who are, you know, sort of hiding, you know, within, uh, well, government as well as just, you know, political poll and stuff like that, so not completely irrelevant for uh, today. <laughs> and in fact, you know, uh, the main villain in this, um, John Savage, um, as uh, Kendrick, you know, just the way he talks, you know, to people, um, it feels very, you know, very fake, very, uh, you know, just, uh, uh, <laughs> it reminds me of uh, maybe our president these days, but let's not go into that too much, huh? <laughs> Um, but you know, he actually played that sort of coolly. I think uh, he worked decently as a villain and kind of just want to see him die. <laughs> um, so I'll give him that. You also have Michael Ironside in this movie. Um, you know, as uh, the colonel, the one who assembles the team, he knows uh, Matt Malcolm's character and everything like that. Um, ironically, because I just uploaded my review of the original Total Recall, so check out that too. Um, you also have Jennifer Rubin, who of course is in, uh, you know, one of the most beloved films of the, the horror genre, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors. 
Um, she's likable here. She gets to have a physical presence, surprisingly, and that works pretty well. Um, although I didn't really care for her Bob haircut in this movie, I'll be honest. But her and Michael Ironside, I feel like, were the best from an acting standpoint in this. Matt Milcom, uh, you can definitely tell he knows what he's doing physically. He's a, back, uh, he's a black belt in uh, Kempo, um, and he handles himself well. He has a, you know, a kind of a nice, kind, likability factor to him. Um, although I would say he is a touch uh, sort of doll as well. There's not a whole lot of dimension that comes off of it. Um, but that's just the kind of movie it is too, maybe. Um, uh, I will say, you know, that I wish they had sort of made it a little bit more similar again to the first film. Because um, I think that would have been more interesting than uh, what we got here, which is basically like a sort of a group movie of them trying to take down this... Uh, this you know, gang of neo-nazis. I, you know, I wish there was like some kind of like desert jungle setting at least or something like that to make it sort of feel closer. I don't know. Um, what is what is with that? The rest of the cast is a uh, decent sort of hit or miss but uh, a little unmemorable. Um, the action's pretty good. The choreography is decent. Um, again Matt Mel McCalm really does handle himself. He does throw some really smooth kicks, and again, you can tell he's seamless with uh, the work when it comes to that. Um, although I wouldn't say he really stood out as much as he'd want as a lead, especially, you know, coming after uh, Dolph Lundgren of all people. Um, but, you know, he has, again, just a nice, you know, likability that passes, I think. Um... You know, so it plays out in uh, you know, fairly satisfying, expected ways, and, you know, why am I bashing this for being expected, you know, there, there's a lot in this genre that are predictable, yet still enjoyable, and this one has a general enjoyment to it, um, although I'm not sure how much I remember if it wasn't just called Red Scorpion 2, <laughs> um, it, it's fine, it's fine, um, you could say Matt McCollum deserved more of a shot, you know, this is like one of uh, about five films that he led. Um, he definitely deserved a more, uh, you know, sort of direct on-camera career, I think. Um, so, yeah, overall, not the best, uh, not the worst. Uh, some of the, the choreography is good, Matt McCollum was really good at handling it, but some of it just didn't work, like you could tell, it, some of the hits weren't really connecting, you know, with the guy's face and stuff, but... You know, it's one of those things, and definitely, you know, low budget, you know, I love a lot of low budget crap, but, you know, it definitely had, like, a very much, like, early in the morning, you know, made-for-TV vibe to it, and it, it was okay. Um, I feel like they could have done more with uh, McCombs' character to make him, uh, you know, pop a bit. But, you know, it is what it is with that. If I had to rate it, I'd give it, you know, uh, why don't we just stick with like a 70% give or take? So yeah, then you guys thought about this. Let me know what you thought about all of these. You can uh, give me a follow on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And uh, yeah, I'll catch you guys next time. Peace.